Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in AP English and World of Ideas lecture number 25. We are now introducing in lecture number 25, and by the way, halfway through our lectures for World of Ideas, the introduction to unit 5, which is nature. Now we have five authors that we'll address in this unit. The great Francis Bacon, who's of studies, we have lectures on at LearnStrong.net. Charles Darwin, a lecture in the Harvard Classics folder on LearnStrong.net. Stephen Jay Gould, as well as uh, the great uh, Kaku, and then finally uh, Richard Dawkins. So this will uh, round out our, uh, our um, study of nature. Now, again, our assumptions are that you've been uh, following us in LearnStrong.net in the uh, AP folder, World of Ideas folder, for lectures 1 through 24. That is important because I'm going to be making references back to some of those earlier, earlier titles. And as I've already said, the assumption is that as well, you've been kind of following our stuff on LearnStrong.net in the, in the different folders, and I'll, and I'll sometimes make references, especially in 3A. Again, our assumptions as well is that you understand our learning theory, the desire to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways through active reading, and we'll do that especially by answering three guiding questions. Level one, what does the text say? Level two, what does the text mean? Level three, how can I relate to this information in a meaningful way? We'll work level one summary here in a moment uh, with the Jacobus text, World of Ideas, unit number five. However, before we get there, for each one of these intros, I've enjoyed sharing with you a little bit of Mortimer Adler, the great Mortimer Adler, uh, and, and some of his ideas from Syntopicon. I, I want to mention Adler here especially because in one of the important texts of 303, How to Read a Book, which many of you smile at even now having read it because it's such a fun title, and yet what Adler argued is that you have to learn how to read within specific disciplines. Reading in literature, for example, in the humanities, is different from reading in the sciences. Now we're going to see that immediately when we pick up this unit number five. Let's go to Syntopicon. Adler gives 25 pages of Syntopicon to the topic of nature. These are the opening lines from what he has to say. It's such brilliant prose. I'd love to share it with you. Nature, he says, is a term which draws its meaning from the other terms with which it is associated by implication or contrast. Yet it's not one of a fixed pair of terms, like necessity and contingency, uh, one in many, universal and particular, war and peace. When things are divided into the natural and the artificial, or into the natural and the conventional, the opposite of the natural does not represent a loss or violation of nature, but rather a transformation of nature through the addition of a new factor. The unnatural, on the other hand, seems to be merely a deviation, a falling away from, or sometimes a transgression of nature. We think of our St. Augustine. Most of the terms which stand in opposition to nature represent the activity or being of man or God. As appears in the chapter on medicine, Galen thinks of nature as an artist. Harvey later develops this notion. But with these two exceptions, the traditional theory of art conceives it not as a work of nature, but of humans. Despite other differences in the great books on the theory of art, especially with regard to art's imitation of nature, we think of Aristotle, there seems to be a common understanding that works of art are distinguished from productions of nature by the fact that man has added something to nature. A human, uh, I'm sorry, a world which man left exactly as he found it would be a world without art or any trace of the artificial in it. The ancient authors who contrast the natural and the conventional and the modern authors who distinguish man's life in a state of nature from his life in civil society seem to imply that without something done by man, there would be nothing conventional or political. Locke appears to be an exception here. He thinks that there is a natural as well as a civil or political society. Natural society is the society of, quote, men living together according to reason without a common superior on earth with authority to judge between them in code. Unlike Hobbes or Kant or Hegel, Locke does not think that the state of nature is necessarily a state of war. But this difference between Locke and others does not affect the point that the political institutions of civil society are things of man's own devising. There may be among the social insects natural organizations such as the beehive and the ant mound, 
we think of, uh, uh, of um, in, in terms of especially the, both of these, but certainly the bees, we think about uh, uh, the great the great writer of the uh, 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 Virgil, uh, uh, who writes in, in the Gorgias, right, in the, in the Gorgias. Um, but uh, he says there may be among the social insects natural organizations such as the beehive and the ant mill. It may even be as Locke supposes that in a state of nature, quote, men living together according to reason, end quote, would constitute a society. But in neither case does the society we call a state result. States differ from one another in many features of their political organization. We think of, of course, our, uh, Plato's Republic, Book 8, and, and, and of course, 9. In this sense, the state or political community is conventional rather than national, uh, natural. Its institutions are humanely contrived. And then just to finish now this introduction. The social contract theory of the origin of the state, we know about this from our study of Rousseau earlier in Jacobus, is, uh, is not necessarily involved in the recognition that the state is partly conventional. Aristotle, for example, who regards the state as natural, he speaks of it as, quote, a creation of nature, end quote, does not think of the political community as natural in the sense in which a beehive is natural. That men should form political communities is, in his view, the result of a natural desire, a tendency inherent in the nature of man as a political animal. But what form the political community will take is at least partly determined by the particular arrangements men voluntarily institute. Man-made laws are conventional, but so are also other institutions which vary from state to state or change from time to time. Well, that's Adler, and that's a great introduction to the topic of the natural, the world of nature. Let's now go to Jacobus, page 374. As we've done in the past, we'll just simply read the uh, paragraphs, and we'll let you do some uh, note-taking note at level one. He says, Ideas of nature, of the world that exists outside human invention, have formed the core of human inquiry since the beginning of society. Early civilizations viewed nature as a willfully creative and destructive force and structured their religions around gods and goddesses who personified components of the natural world. We immediately think of Homer. For example, many early Egyptian and Greek religions worshipped the sun gods such as Ra or Apollo and performed rituals meant to gain the favor of these gods. This affiliation of nature with divine forces was gradually joined by a new approach, scientific inquiry. The basic premise of scientific inquiry was that the physical world could be understood through careful observation and described through consistent and logical rules. Lucretius, a prominent Roman thinker who lived during the first century BC, wrote of one of the first treatises on natural science in his work on the nature of things. He argued that nature should be viewed in purely materialistic terms and that the universe was composed of minute pieces of matter or atoms. During the Renaissance, the pursuit of a scientific understanding of the world culminated with, of course, Copernicus, 1473 to 1543, heliocentric, sun-centered model of the universe. In the 17th century, Sir Isaac Newton, 1642 to 1727, further developed these methods of objective, obser uh, 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 objective observation while formulating his laws of physics. Although nature was still believed to be the creation of divine force, its workings were gradually becoming more and more accessible to human reasoning. In the process, humans began to reevaluate their place in nature. Put it in your notes, go back and take a look at it if you've missed it at learnstrong.net in the Senior A folder. We will make that argument in the lecture about the scientific enlightenment, the age of reason, and more particularly what we have referred to following uh, the great Ken Wilber's observations, the differentiation of the value spheres, where arts, morals, and science begin to kind of separate, and the church no longer has the tremendous power that it once had. As that happened, the world of modern science began to rise with, of course, the scientific method. The five writers, now to continue with Jacobus, the five writers in this section offer various ideas on nature from the origin of life to the structure of the universe. Many of their theories are contended in their time and continue to be debated and rethought, but they share the underlying mission of deciphering the forces that shape our world and our lives. Now to the first writer. At the time Bacon wrote, before the advent of sophisticated scientific instruments, most scientists relied on their five senses and their theoretical preconceptions to investigate the workings of the world around them. In The Four Idols, the essay by Bacon, Bacon raises questions about these 
modes of scientific inquiry by asking, what casts of mind are essential to gaining knowledge? This will sound so uh, familiar from our last uh, Unit 4 study of the mind, right? Another question, what prevents us from understanding nature clearly? We think about Ralph Waldo Emerson and our essays there in the junior folder on Larkstrong.net. But thus critiquing traditional by, I'm sorry, thus critiquing pre, uh, traditional presumptions and methods of investigation, Bacon challenges his readers to examine nature with new mental tools. To the second now reading. In Natural Selection, Charles Darwin uh, in his essay. In Natural Selection, Charles Darwin proposes a theory that is still controversial. While on a voyage around South America in the age of S. Beagle, Darwin observed remarkable similarities in the structures of various animals. He approached these discoveries with the advantages of a good education, a deep knowledge of the Bible, and theology. He was trained, as we have said in another lecture, as a minister, and a systematic and inquiring mind. Ultimately, he developed his theories of evolution to explain the significance of resemblances he detected among his scientific samples of insects and flowers and other forms of life. E explaining the nature of nature forms the underpinnings of Darwin's work. Now to continue, our next reading, Stephen Jay Gould's Non-Moral Nature. Stephen Jay Gould's uh, Stephen Jay Gould in Non-Moral Nature examines the results of the kind of thinking that Bacon deplored in the 17th century, but that nevertheless flourished in the 19th century, interpreting the world of nature as if it were fashioned by someone with, same with the same prejudices as the Victorian scientists, usually a minister, led people to see good and evil in animal and insect behavior. Even today, most of us see the world in such terms. To Gould, however, the world is the world. Moral issues relate to people, not to dolphins or sharks. For him, thinking like a naturalist means achieving detachment. How we approach the evidence before us, in other words, is, an important, is as important as what we actually observe. Gould wants us to give up anthropomorphic ways of interpreting evidence in favor of a more rational approach. As he demonstrates, this is not easy to achieve. And of course, these ideas of Gould have been very influential at the end of the 20th 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century. Let's go, now go to Kaku. Puzzling out the most current thinking in the theoretical physics requires speculation that borders on what Michel Kaku will call craziness. The question he raises about a new theory of the universe is not whether it seems rational, but whether it is crazy enough to be possible. Kaku is a theoretical physicist who helped develop the superstring theory, which he hopes will reconcile the quantum theory and the theory of relativity. Both of these theories explain a great deal about the universe, but each falls short in accounting for all the four fundamental forces. The superstring theory, which asserts that the atom is composed of strings of energy vibrating at different frequencies, apparently reconciles the theories and permits physicists to develop mathematical equations which accurately predict physical events. And since this essay is, was published, a whole lot has been developed since. My hope is that you'll continue with your studies after you read Kaku's uh, essay. Finally, Richard Dawkins, sometimes described as an alter Darwinius, probes into the microbiology of evolution, examining the genetic material that permits us to begin to trace the origin of species, including, of course, our own species, Homo sapiens. He finds the lines of descent stretch back to the continent of his birth, Africa, where he postulates the existence of African Eve, the female from which we all have descended. Although his method is complex and his results are not absolutely certain, Dawkins is confident that regardless of whether we, descended from, uh, we descend from a single female who lived in Africa some 200,000 years ago, we did descend from life that has its origin in Africa. His examination of details of our genetic code depends on sophisticated instruments and understanding that did not exist only a few years ago. Although Francis Bacon probably would not understand the astonishing theories that the other writers in this section discuss, he would appreciate the methods they use to reason about their hypothesis and to establish their conclusions. All these writers are joined in the desire to understand the workings of nature and in their profound respect for the questions that remain. With that in mind, let's turn now to Francis Bacon and enjoy the four idols. Thank you.